50 years, Kaw Valley Bicycle Club has been a staple of the Northeast Kansas cycling community. Founded in 1971 as the Topeka Wheelman by a handful of enthusiasts on 10-speed bicycles, the club now has over 190 members and offers sanctioned club rides on nearly every day of the week during the summer months, with several of these rides continuing on into the winter. Why has this organization continued to flourish, while other cycling groups have come and gone? And what are the challenges to come? To answer these questions, we will hear from board members and past presidents about their experiences and their vision for the future of the organization. But first, some club history. The three main organizers in 1971 were Phil Menninger, Carl Hummel, and Gene Wansing. Carl was the mechanic at Stevens Cycle, the local Schwinn dealer in Topeka. Customers would often ask if there were any organized rides in town. The owner of the bike shop, Sarah Stevens, checked with Gene Wansing, who was with the City Parks Department. Gene's boss knew Phil Menninger and introduced him to Gene. Shortly after, Phil Carl and Gene met to discuss forming a cycling club. And we had our first meeting in um, my apartment after I got off work, um, number 11 at 20, 21st and, uh, 21st and uh, McVicker. And uh, the three of us uh, talked for a while and decided it's a go ahead, we need to go ahead and start this club. So we made up a, a news release and posted those around town for uh, April the 22nd of 1971 at Crestview Community Center. And uh, Tan decided to uh, join that first night. And so we were off and running as the uh, Topeka Wheelman. Phil Menninger was elected president and Gene Wansing vice president. Bylaws were adopted in June of 1971. And by July, the club had quickly grown to 107 members. To promote the group, club patches were ordered and when they arrived, the name read Topeka Wheelmen instead of Wheelmen. But the patches sold out anyway. The purpose of the club was to promote bicycle rides as social and fitness events. Early emphasis was on awarding patches to completers of major rides as an incentive to participate. Again, this followed the League of American Wheelmen model of awarding patches for events. Another early goal of the club was to sponsor racing Founding member Gene Wansing, who would become president in 1974, recalls that the logistics of holding races had its challenges. Since very few members were involved in racing, it was felt through the board at the time that uh, it would be difficult to sponsor races if we didn't have um, persons to work the races. A lot of different events where our members would uh, volunteer to uh, work as corner marshals or registration, uh, of course, the Tin Man uh, triathlon. But when you get into racing, you have registration, licensing, approvals. We were always concerned with safety, uh, even on our very casual rides. And uh, some motorists uh, just did not understand that you were stopping them so the guys could ride through on bicycles. And we'd been very fortunate for many, many years. Over the last 10 to 20 years, we've had a couple of fatalities on organized rides and or races. Uh, that was one of uh, Phil Menninger's concerns all along. Problems surrounding racing events led the board of directors to reevaluate the core values of the club. In 1974, Jerry Morgan joined the group and recalls this as a turning point. That was one of the, the statements that was made when I first joined from, from Phil Menninger and, and Gene Wansing and Carl Hummel is that each year, each spring, the, over the winter, the, the club would just fall apart. And if you would have a race event, the race people didn't want to be on the race corners. They didn't want to um, sign the people in. They wanted to concentrate on racing because it was personal achievement. Do we want to have a club that races bicycles or do we want to have a club that's, that's involved in, in activities uh, uh, to promote, you know, social events and small rides out to the park and back in, in an evening. In 1975, Jerry Morgan was elected president 
And to clarify the nature of the club as a non-racing entity, the name was changed to Caw Valley Bicycle Touring Club. Also, a new logo and patch were designed. To let the public know exactly what we were doing. We were a group of people that were just out touring. We weren't, we weren't competitiveness. They felt like that the League of America Wheelmen, uh, well, I'm not going to go because I'm not a wheelman. We wanted to say, hey, you want to go on a bicycle ride? You want to go on a little tour? And one of the things we soon learned is we would have people show up if we had food. I've learned that in a lot of organizations. If anytime you have, um, have a, an event and, and provide food, even if everybody brings their own uh, food to help put the event on, people will show up. 1975 also saw the beginning of what would become a yearly ride tradition for the next 46 years to the present. A national organization called Bike Centennial, now known as Adventure Cycling, was encouraging local bike clubs to sponsor a 200-mile ride for the 1976 bicentennial year. What we now know as the Cottonwood 200 started out as a ride on the 4th of July in 1975 from Topeka to Council Grove. It was a test run for the bicentennial ride the following year. Registration for the ride was listed in the newsletter at $2. But it turned out that July was not the best time to be on a bike all day in the Kansas sun. So the 200 mile ride in 1976 was moved to Memorial Day in May to take advantage of more favorable weather and to also enjoy the beauty of the newly green Flint Hills. The ride was dubbed the 1976 Cottonwood Falls Bicentennial Tour. Jerry Morgan stayed on as president in 1976 and he helped in designing new club jerseys and also wrote the Articles of Incorporation for KVBTC as a nonprofit organization. This was at the urging of Phil Minninger, who was concerned that liability issues might put club members at risk. In 1977, Rich Farr would become president, and the Bicentennial Ride was rebranded as the Cottonwood 200. Bill Roy joined the club in 1976 as a 22-year-old first-year law student at Washburn University and recalls that the Cottonwood 200 continued to gain popularity with added features in 1978, including a Saturday dinner and a Sunday lunch. To cover costs, registration was increased to $6. In 1979, Bill became president with an eye on expanding the ride schedule and adding more fun events. After serving as president, Bill Roy, Ron Alexander, and John Richter would start a progressive century ride in 1983. Originating from the parking lot at the law school on the Washburn campus, it was a three-loop route giving riders the opportunity to do a 25-mile loop that was a quarter century, then a 37-mile loop that would make a metric century of 62 miles, and with the final loop of 38 miles to complete a century. And then in 1984 uh, is when it became the Capital Classic, immediately became the Capital Classic. Uh, John Carlin was governor and Ron Alexander was, was with some state agency, also in the Bicycle Club, as was John, and John Richter was the Secretary of State's office. But they were looking for events in, in, in kind of a, a fitness weekend around the Capitol. I took the idea of what had been really a spring loop century in 1983, and we just put it right into the governor's fitness fair, and there was a t-shirt, and it was called the Capitol Classic. From there, the Capitol Classic would start on the state capitol grounds until 9-11, when access to the Capitol became restricted. In later years, the Capitol Classic would start in early May, across the street at the Judicial Center parking lot and various other locations. It became considered the warm-up ride for the Cottonwood 200 held at the end of May on Memorial Day. The Cottonwood 200 would ebb and flow with rider numbers every year. But by 1992, the ride was struggling with less than 30 riders attending. Mark Kostler, who had ridden his first Cottonwood 200 at that time, remembers a watershed moment for the Cottonwood that would help the ride become more popular. 
And the riot had a major change in 1993. We had a very wet spring. The Corps of Engineers was having to hold water back and what was the campground was now underwater. And John Long, who was organizing the ride that year, made a desperate call to the local school district and said, hey, can we stay at the high school? And they said, certainly. And that was not only a stroke of good luck, but it was the best stroke of good fortune. Now we were having the riders stay within a block of the main street of Council Grove. So it made it a much more enjoyable ride that you could finish the ride, go get cleaned up at the high school, and then walk around downtown. That's one of the reasons the ride grew, was that more people enjoyed being able to stay inside, having access to hot showers, and being out of the weather. And my goal when I started or organizing it was, I was doing rides myself, uh, was doing BAK, had done uh, the Cottonwood, had done the Capital Classic, and had done rides in other states, and thought, you know, we can improve this ride. Simple things like trying to make the sag stops better, um, trying to have more things for the riders to do. And each year, we were successful in being able to attract a few more riders. To me, the heart of the club is the volunteers. Um, everybody loves to ride. Um, and when it's a simple weekly ride and people just show up and ride together, that, that's the great social thing about uh, riding. But the organized rides to figure out what the route's gonna be and how you're gonna have a sag stop and what items you're gonna have for it, take some volunteer time. Um, if you're driven, you can do a lot by yourself. But you can burn out if you don't get enough volunteers. And I have found it with the club, most people will help if asked, but you have to ask them person to person. Rides like that take a huge amount of volunteers and often you have to call them up or talk to them individually. And that's when the club is successful because the more great rides we can put on, the more people say, hey, I wanna be part of that. That's how we have a great club. Mark would also leave the club as president in 1995, and it was at this time that the club changed the name to Caw Valley Bicycle Club. It was interesting, folks were getting hung up on the touring part of the name. The issue was is that folks thought, well, touring, that means, gee, that means you're getting your bike and putting your panniers on and riding across the country all the time. You know, it just made sense to shorten it up and make it easier for everybody to understand that we were about bicycles. The start of the Bruce Whaley Spirit Ride would begin in 1995. Bruce Whaley was an active young man struck down by a rare form of leukemia. He had served in the Kansas Air National Guard during Desert Shield. He was a student at Washburn University while working at St. Francis Hospital in Topeka and was an active cyclist. While working at St. Francis, Bruce participated in a fundraising bicycle ride organized by the nurses and physicians at St. Francis called the Spirit Ride. After his untimely death, the ride took on his name as a fundraiser for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society to become the Bruce Whaley Spirit Ride. The ride has been operated as a joint effort by the Whaley family and Call Valley Bicycle Club ever since. Bruce's mother, Barb Whaley, would serve on the KVBC board for many years. In 1996, Mark Kostler would stay on as president for another year and continue to be the ride leader for the Cottonwood 200 until the year 2000. That following year, Larry Rhodes, who had also been the newsletter editor, would organize the Cottonwood. But for the 2002 season, no one volunteered to take over organizing the Cottonwood, and that year was skipped. Another crucial point for the club happened in 2002. Not only was the club lacking in volunteers to support the Cottonwood, there was no president, vice president, or secretary. Larry Rhodes, who had been the newsletter editor since 1989, wrote an article in the January 2003 cyclometer titled, What Club? In his call to action, he compared the club to a bike without a headset. 
and he basically was telling us that he didn't know that if the, if the club was going to be around for the Cottonwood the next year. So I volunteered, and then there's a lot of other people that volunteered at the same time. So, uh, you know, I think that that was a really low point in the history of the club, and it's, it was close to, could have folded, but um, Larry Road saved it. That's the thing about the, the board, is it needs to, to churn new people in to get new ideas. You need fresh direction uh, periodically in a group like this. Doug had a vision to revitalize daily rides that would attract the average cyclist and even rides to target beginner riders such as the Pazegos ride along the Shunga Trail, also appealing to families with kids. The key to each of these rides was to have a ride leader who would be there at every ride to make sure new riders were comfortable and knew what the route was. Up until then, the ride week mostly consisted of the Dover Dogs and Fairlawn Starter which were essentially show-and-go faster rides with no particular designated leader. In 2003, Mark Kostler returned to bring back the Cottonwood 200 and would continue to organize the ride until 2016. In 2007, Andy Phillips and Christy Razik would co-chair as president until Mark Kostler would return for another year as president in 2008. Following Mark, Andy and Christy would resume co-chair duties for another two years until Heath Glenn was elected president in 2011. Heath had an eye on modernizing the business processes of the club by migrating the newsletter to digital form and delivered through email to eliminate the postage expense. I mean, I remember our biggest expense when I first started on the board was doing the newsletter. And the newsletter, you know, because we had to have it printed and then we mailed it. And so it was running us two to three hundred dollars a month. Finally, we decided, you know, once kind of the digital age started coming in, that was a big savings to the club. Heath Glenn also oversaw revamping the website, updating the membership list, and worked toward expanding weekly group rides. By this time, Bill Lucero had joined the board of directors, and together, Bill and Heath would take on what would become a major milestone for bicycling in the state of Kansas and Caw Valley Bicycle Club. Bill Lucero, who was, I think, held vice president at the time, was a lobbyist for another function with the, up at the Capitol for the state of Kansas. And uh, this is when we were seeing the big three feet passing law. And we came up with the notion of what would it take to get this law passed in Kansas and we we relied on Bill real heavy on this because he he knew what it took to to get in there and talk to these senators and representatives and he said don't be surprised this this may take three or four years to get done. I had extensive knowledge of <laughs> how to access various different uh, legislators and how to lobby effectively and how not to. Caw Valley became the prime mover of the uh, legislation with assistance of a lot of other clubs and organizations around the state. We got linked up with the motorcycle advocacy that was pushing the dead red. For those not familiar with the dead red, that was when you pull up, your vehicle didn't have enough weight to trigger the red light you could go ahead and, once it was safe, go through that red light. So they tagged the two together, and that was the biggest blessing we could have got. We, we passed that law the, the very first year. The club in Topeka spearheaded and pulled everybody throughout the state together, and we got that law passed. Bill said that while passing the three-foot law, along with the dead red, were one of his proudest accomplishments. Another benchmark was the start of the Old Fogies weekday ride. The idea sprang forth when Bill Lucero, Steve Fike, and Lou Hudson were working a SAG together at the 2011 Capitol Classic. After another email volley, the Fogie ride was finally born on Tuesday, June 21st, 2011. Harry Bishop, Mike Baker, David Sanchez, and Bill rode the same route to Dover, and the rest is history. One of the guys suggested uh, all of us were kind of up there in age. We're a bunch of old fogies that uh, were doing this. I thought, that's an interesting name. 
I'm looking for a name for this ride. Why don't we call it the Old Fogey Ride? The Old Fogey Ride has been a weekly staple for retired club members ever since. Eventually, this simple ride turned into a quest to see how long the weekly streak could last. The Fogies never missed a weekly ride of at least 10 miles. Soon, a requirement developed to consider the Fogey Ride as countable for the week. There must be at least two riders that complete a distance of 10 miles, and the ride must occur during weekday working hours. People started showing up for it, other retirees, and uh, got adopted by uh, several people and became their ride. On January 12th, 2021, the Old Fogies completed their 500th consecutive ride. The 10th anniversary of the Fogie ride will be in mid-June 2021. Throughout its 50-year history, the Calm Valley Bicycle Club has overcome multiple challenges. But now, a year after it started, the COVID pandemic is still wreaking havoc on in-person gatherings. The large organized KVBC flagship rides of the Cottonwood 200 and Capital Classic have been canceled in 2021, along with Bike Across Kansas and other major rides across the country. This puts club leadership in uncharted territory for a second year. Jim Edwards, who has been a KVBC board member off and on since 1983, offers a long view perspective on what the club leadership has dealt with over the years. Having served on the board, I mean, things just don't happen. It has to, it survived because there's been leadership in rides. Leadership in not only of the club, but leadership in the communications made a big difference and will make a big difference for the future. If we still didn't have a monthly newsletter, if it was just kind of, people forget about it. If, you, if you've got good communications where people uh, know what's going on, members know what's going on, they, they know the options that are available to them for rides, then it, then it works. With only local out and back rides available, keeping the interest of current members and attracting new members relies more heavily on the variety of these local rides. And so now they have beginner's rides, they have gravel rides, they have people mountain bikes. So it's I, in that regard, I think it's, it's, it's grown, and, but the club has been able to adapt to it. Even without COVID, more challenges lay ahead for the club in the future. Most of the membership consists of older adults. Getting the word out to prospective young members can be tough. You know, we've got the, the 70s and the 60-year-olds and the 50-year-olds and the 40-year-olds, but then when you get down to the, the 30s and the 20s and even younger, you don't have as many. And for bicycling, to keep it going, you've got to have those young people you know, a lot of people think that, you know, to come on our rides, you know, they have to have all the top gear and all that kind of stuff, but you don't. Three big things is you got to have a bike, you got to have a helmet, and you got to have a water bottle. Even when large organized rides are able to restart, without new volunteers and new energy to carry on, the flagship rides that attract riders from outside the community may falter again. Constant challenge to make sure that we are recruiting folks to help step into positions of help and authority. It's not a good thing for any nonprofit or club to have the same folks at the top all the time. So we always need to make sure we're asking folks to help. Most folks will respond if asked, but if we don't ask, we'll never know and we may miss out on some great volunteers. Having entry-level rides and including all comers will be the key to bringing in new members. To starting out with the club or just starting out on an organized ride, it's, it's really an adventure. Uh, folks that say, oh, I only ride a few miles or, oh, I don't ride very fast. I'm not a racer. Well, you're still welcomed in, in the club. Truly, it's all about being social. Every, it seems like every ride ends with, we're gonna go eat somewhere. Yeah, whether it's pie, pizza, whatever, why that is, I don't know, but pretty good deal. The club becomes family, I think. Um, I have probably all of my best friends are cyclists. You know, there's lots of people in the club I go on vacation with, they're my friends, and it's a good thing to have in a community as a strong bike club. When you start the club, one of three co-founders, you have no idea that 
it's going to be going that long. You're always just kind of looking for the next week, the next month. Well, next summer we're going to do this, or next spring we're going to try this ride. It was really neat to step back and have others come and take it and keep it going. And that was a real um, thing to be able to stand back and watch your kid run, you know. As the future unfolds, Call Valley Bicycle Club will continue to offer rides and events that are fun and social while advocating for a better cycling experience for all. The flagship rides will return, along with many more adventures just waiting to be discovered. <music>